Okay, I think we're all, uh, all president, pre president? No, I, I don't drink anymore and I still can't talk. We're all present and accounted for. Um, I am not sitting at the head of the table unless, um, because of the issues that are gonna be brought up today and their importance to the state of Maine. So um, I am going to uh, turn the chairmanship over to uh, Tony who will run the meeting. Um, I do, before I do that, I do want to remind everybody we're no longer a management section. We're now a board. Um, we have uh, two additional uh, folks at the table now. Uh, Terry Stockwell, who was here um, for the New England Fisheries Management Council. We don't have four people from the state of Maine, so Terry <laughs> on the uh, board. So Terry, he, he did move over one extra seat for separation <laughs> from Maine. <laughs> Um, and uh, would, would also like to uh, welcome Allie Murphy from Garfo. So welcome, Allie. Um, we are obviously at a point in time with herring and herring management that we have many challenges uh, ahead of us. Uh, and um, again, that's the reason why I'm going to turn the chair uh, over to staff for this particular meeting. So with that, uh, Tony. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, the board has an agenda before them. Are there any changes to the agenda? If it's none, then we will. Oh, Pat, sorry. I will have one item on enforcement under other business. Okay. We will add one enforcement item. With that change, are there any other changes? Seeing none, without objection, we'll consider this a agenda approved. In the meeting materials, you had the proceedings from the August 2018 meeting. Were there any uh, changes to those proceedings? With none, without objection, we'll consider those proceedings approved. Then we'll move right into the first agenda item, which is the 2018 Atlantic Caring Benchmark Assessment for Peer Review Report. If you recall, at the August meeting, we had the report of the assessment itself, but the peer review report had not been released. Um, and so Pat's gonna go through um, what the peer reviewers said about the assessment. Thank you, Madam Chair. The Herring uh, Benchmark Stock Assessment was peer reviewed in late June uh, in Woods Hole. The uh, review committee consisted of uh, Dr. Pat Sullivan, from Cornell University and the New England Council SSC. Other panelists included Kathy Dishmont from Australia, Dr. Needle from the United Kingdom, and uh, Jeff Tingley from New Zealand. The assessment terms of reference are listed on the, on the board. I won't go through them individually, um, but we'll simply state that all the terms of reference were successfully addressed and completed um, through the assessment and based on the review panel's uh, evaluations. The overall review panel findings are that the 2018 assessment is accepted by the review panel and they agreed that the stock status is not overfished and no overfishing occurring. Also given low recent recruitment uh, the panel agreed and concluded the prognosis for future stock size is relatively poor. Um, new reference points were presented and the panel uh, found that the approaches used to develop the reference points and to rescale the assessment are scientifically sound and that the uh, new biological reference points cannot be compared to past reference points because they have a different basis. In addition, uh, the panel found that the acoustic index um, added to the trawl survey was an important component of the stock assessment. And also that the herring fishery was responsible for fewer removals than natural predators. Um, this assessment derived consumption estimates um, by uh, mostly uh, fish predators and did not include marine mammals, seabirds, and uh, some fish predators like tuna. And finally, um, the panel agreed with the natural mortality values that were used in the stock assessment. Uh, they thought they were reasonably justified. 
In addition, the review panel had a handful of recommendations. The first um, for, for future assessments is to explore alternative management strategies to better understand implications of stock declines and also to continue building on uh, examination of ecological and environmental factors influencing recruitment and mortality. The addition of the uh, trial survey, acoustic survey uh, or acoustic uh, measures were an improvement, but they also uh, suggested that the assessment group and the science center consider a directed acoustic survey to complement and compare with acoustic data collected during trial surveys. Um, also, um, although a number of predators and consumption estimates were derived um, for future assessments, the panel thought the assessment team could try to include additional predator species if the data are available. Also consider alternative approaches to estimating reference point, point proxies. And uh, finally, to continue exploring stock structure. Um, I think you all have seen these figures before, but you can see uh, the herring catch by gear type, um, notably declines in recent years, um, perhaps tied to increased management measures. And um, perhaps most importantly, herring recruitment um, has been uh, very low since 2013. Um, including uh, very uh, all-time lows in, in 2016 and 2017. Again, I think you've seen these before, but these are the trends in spawning stock biomass and fishing mortality. Current values for 2017 estimated at a little over 141,000 metric tons for SSB and F 2017 of 0.45. And I'll wrap up with uh, herring stock status that in 2017, the stock um, was not overfished and overfishing not occurring. And the current reference points are up there as well. Thank you, Madam Chair. That concludes the review panel report. Thank you, Pat. Does anybody have any questions for Pat? Dr. Pierce. Yeah, Pat, uh, do you know how the projections were run? That is, did they use average recruitment over the time series, or did they factor in this rather alarming uh, last five years way below average value? Because it has a lot to do with the conclusion that overfishing is not occurring and we're not overfished. Sure. Um, they used, I think, two different range of ranges of years. I think they used the recent recruitment um, in part for the projections, I think for the, the coming year to develop the 2018 um, estimates. And then they used the entire t time series, I think 1965 um, to, to 2016 for um, further out years. All right, thank you for that uh, kind of rhetorical question. I've got the uh, assessment in front of me, and you're quite correct. I wondered if you knew and you did know. God bless you. You're right on top of it. But in the uh, special comment section uh, of the assessment, it says something that really hasn't been highlighted at all by anybody, and this includes at the, at the New England Council, where it says, note that based on the recent run of below average estimated annual recruits, and the assumed catch in 2018 in both example projection scenarios, the projected status would change to the stock being overfished and overfishing occurring in 2018 and likely overfished in years 2019 to 21. So I'm going with the assumption that we're working with a rather desperate situation regarding the, the status of sea herring and how we manage it because I don't believe that it was appropriate to use an average recruitment level when over the last five years it was abysmally low. So uh, that's a very special comment that highlights that for all practical purposes, uh, we are overfished and overfishing uh, did occur in 2018. So it should affect our decisions as we move forward. Thank you, Dr. Pierce. Any other questions about the peer review? 
Seeing none, is there a motion to approve the stock assessment and peer review for management use? Is that a yes, David, or, okay, all right. So moved, is there a second to that motion? Ray Kane. I'm gonna read that motion that's on the board. Move to approve the 2018 Atlantic Herring Benchmark Stock Assessment and Peer Review for Management Use. Motion by Mr. Board and seconded by Mr. Kane. Is there any objection to the approval of this motion? Sorry. Are there any abstentions? All right, this motion carries without objection. Okay, moving on to the next agenda item, we will have Megan review and dis, uh, the white paper on the Atlantic Caring Spawning Protections um, that was requested by the management board. Thank you, Mr. Chair, Madam. <laughs> um, all right, so I'll be walking through the Herring white paper today. Um, and as Tony alluded to, this was requested by the board in August to review protections that are provided to spawning herring. And this is primarily pr prompted by the results of the 2018 stock assessment, which, as you just saw, showed reduced signs of recruitment and SSB, particularly over the last five years. The memo has two focuses. Uh, the first is a focus on the existing Gulf of Maine spawning closure protocol to assess the adequacy of our current protections. And then it also provides some considerations regarding spawning aggregation, aggregations in Georgia's Bank and Nantucket Shoals. And this is really intended to inform preliminary discussions. Uh, before getting into the white paper, though, I do want to take a quick detour to the New England Council action, which could impact uh, the discussions had today. So the Council recently took action under Amendment 8 to establish a 12 nautical mile, mi nautical mile buffer in management areas 1A, 1B, 2 east of basically Montauk, and 3, which prohibits the use of midwater trawls year-round. And that is the red line that is seen on the figure on the right. Um, along the Cape, this buffer is extended by two 30-minute squares. So those are the squares 114 and 99 that are on that figure. Uh, this still needs to go through federal review and consideration for implementation by NOAA. But if this buffer is, impact, is implemented, um, it could impact catch in these red highlighted areas. So I wanted to bring this to the board's attention before we talk about spawning protections. So just a reminder on spawning, herring primarily spawn in the northern extent of the species range. And within the Gulf of Maine, Georgia's Bank stock complex, there are three primary spawning locations that have been identified. And those include the coast of Gulf of Maine, Georgia's Bank, and Nantucket Shoals. And just to make sure everyone's on the same page here, um, when I am referring to Nantucket Shoals, I am meaning kind of this green area on the left-hand figure that is off the backside of the Cape. And it almost looks like it forms a check mark with Georgia's Bank. So I am talking about the check part of that check mark as Nantucket Shoals. And then the longer line would be the Georgia's Bank area. So just so everyone's on the same page. Uh, right now, through our plan, we do provide protections to the Gulf of Maine spawning areas, and we do this through a closure pro protocol, which uses a gonad to body index to measure herring maturity in three closure areas, and that is what is shown on the figure in the right. So I'm going to start with the Gulf of Maine spawning closures. Uh, one way to assess the adequacy of our current spawning protocol is to revisit the management alternatives that were included in our Amendment 3 to determine if the options selected are still appropriate. And I'm going to talk about four of the issues that were in that amendment, the monitoring system, the trigger value, the closure period, and the closure area boundaries. And the thesis of the next four slides is that the GSI 30 protocol is really a significant improvement in how we monitor the spawning of herring, but there are ways to continue to strengthen this protocol if the board is interested in that. So starting with our monitoring system, uh, really a paramount change in Amendment 3 was the adoption of the GSI 30 spawning protocol. 
And in January, the TC compared the performance of this new protocol versus the previously used length-based system. And they did this by looking at the 2015 Massachusetts, New Hampshire spawn enclosure. So in 2015, we were still using the length-based system, but we have those samples so we can go back and see what would have happened under the GSI 30 system. Um, and what the TC found is that the spawn enclosure was initiated nearly two weeks early using the length-based protocol, and then this required subsequent, subsequent use of the two-week reclosure. In contrast, if GSI 30 had been used in 2015, the Mass New Hampshire spawn enclosure would have started three days after spawning and likely without need for a reclosure. And so the TC concluded that this GSI 30 system is a significant improvement as it's better able to predict interannual changes in the timing of spawning. Next is our trigger value. So the trigger value is incorporated into the protocol such that the forecasted closure date is the day when GSI 30 is projected to exceed that trigger value. Um, and in Amendment 3, the board implemented a trigger value of 25. And generally, higher trigger values are going to close the fishery later and just before spawning, whereas lower trigger values would encompass more time before spawning but with the existing four-week closure, you may run the risk of not fully covering the spawning season. Uh, some of the other values in Amendment 3 ranged from 23 to 28, so you can see the value of 25 is really right in the middle of that range. Again, in their January memo, the TC evaluated the effectiveness of the trigger value, and they found that from 2015 to 2017, the current trigger value resulted in a spawning closure that started within a few days of when the population reached 25% spawning. And so I think the question for the board to consider is whether initiating a closure when about 25% of the population is spawning is appropriate. The TC did note that reducing a trigger value to 23 or 24 would reduce the probability of greater than 25% spawning fish in the catch. However, it's important to note that if you reduce the trigger value, you will also change the default closure dates in this spawning protocol. And so they'll be slightly earlier in the season. And so with the existing four-week closure, you may be frequently reusing the two-week reclosure period. And so this leads us to number three, which is the closure period. So obviously these two issues are closely linked. Amendment 3 did establish a four-week closure uh, with the ability to reclose for two additional weeks. Um, however, there was also an option in Amendment 3 for an initial six-week closure. Again, the January TC memo showed that between 2015 and 2017, the spawning seasons in Massachusetts and New Hampshire were approximately four weeks, 2.3 weeks, and 4.9 weeks. But there are two important caveats here. Uh, the first is there is greater confidence in the longer spawning seasons due to limited sampling in 2016. So there's greater confidence in that four-week and 4.9-week estimate. Um, the TC in their analysis is also defining a spawning season as when 25% of the population is uh, spawning. And so if the board is interested in defining a spawning season at a lower percentage, then this is going to increase the length of a spawning season. Overall, the TC did conclude that use of the four-week spawning closure would likely result in frequent use of the reclosure protocol. Um, and in contrast, a six-week initial closure could increase spawning protection, simplify the protocol, and provide greater predictability. And then the last element in Amendment 3 are the area boundaries. So Amendment 3 did consider combining the Western Maine and the Massachusetts New Hampshire spawning areas into a single unit, given that there was no difference in the default closure dates under the GSI 30 protocol. Ultimately, the board decided to maintain these distinct spawning areas, given concerns that a widespread closure could impact bait availability. The TC did not evaluate this in their January memo, but we can look at 2016 and 2017 to see when those two areas had their spawning closures uh, started to see if there's any differences. 
And we do see that there are slight differences. So Western Maine was started September 18th and September 26th versus Massachusetts, New Hampshire starting a little later, October 2nd and October 1st. So there does seem to be a slight difference, at least for those two years. All right, so moving on to the second portion of the spawning white paper. This is considerations for Georgia's Bank and Nantucket Shoals. Uh, both of these areas are recognized as major spawning areas for herring, but they do not have protections that are specific to spawning. Um, and as a result, we had several questions from commissioners, um, and so hopefully this will start the discussion on that topic. I'm going to talk about two things, uh, the availability of samples, and then also the size and location of a closure. So our current GSI 30 protocol requires samples to annually inform the relationship between GSI and maturity. And while we've had a long-term practice of using closures in the Gulf of Maine to protect spawning herring, um, we have not had that in George's Bank in Nantucket Shoals. And as a result, we have much fewer samples from those regions. A result of this is that the spatial and seasonal spawning patterns in George's Bank in Nantucket Shoals are less well known. And so it may not be as simple as just moving one system to a new area. There may need to be some work that's done ahead of time to inform that GSI process. Um, I also want to note that the ability to collect samples from all regions may be impacted by expected reductions in the ACL starting next year. So that's just something to keep in mind as we talk about this. And then secondly, um, consideration for the size and location of a closure. And speaking specifically on George's Bank, um, that is a large spawning area which encompasses almost the entire northern edge of the bank. Um, and as a result, it may be that spawning is not occurring at the same time throughout that whole region. Ideally, we want spawning closures that are going to maximize protection to herring and minimize economic impacts. And in the Gulf of Maine, we have done that by using discrete areas that can account for these spatial and temporal differences in spawning. But the cost of this is that we require more samples from the Gulf of Maine each year. Uh, in contrast, we could also take an approach of a single large closure, and that would require fewer samples to inform each year. But likely this is going to be a longer closure to encompass all of the different timing of spawning in a large area, and it may have greater impacts on industry. So just to summarize, for the Gulf of Maine, uh, the GSI 30 protocol is a significant improvement over the length-based system, and there may be opportunities to strengthen protections to spawning, particularly through the trigger value and the closure period. For Georgia's Bank in Nantucket Shoals, we do have fewer samples collected to date, so there is some uncertainty about the spawning patterns that are occurring in those regions. Um, and it's also important to consider the size of a closure, sampling needs, and then impacts to industry. And with that, I will take any questions. Do we have questions for Megan? Senator Waters. Uh, thank you. Um, on the economic impact issue, I guess the question in my mind is, is there a way really to weigh the economic impacts on the extended closure potential on Georgia's bank against the economic impact of not doing the closure on the resource? Um, I haven't seen any analysis of that to date, and I, it sounds like that could be a cumbersome endeavor. Um, so. I don't have a great answer to that question, but I, I don't have an answer, is my answer. Do you have a response? Just to say, some of that work has been done by the council, but not specifically regarding this. So that would have to be something that some economists would have to take a look at. Dr. Pierce. Yeah, first of all, uh, thanks for the white paper. Megan, you and those who contributed to the white paper, it was very helpful and it was a nice follow-up to the white paper that was done in 2013, again by ASMFC staff working with the different states. Um, my question is, of all the information you have provided regarding you know, where and when 
uh, sea having spawned in the Nantucket Shoals, George's Bank area. Do you believe that enough, uh, enough uh, investigation or, or, or look into what the Northeast Fishery Science Center has in hand has been done? In other words, have we, we gotten everything out of the center regarding their insights into uh, where and when fish spawn on, on George's Bank and the Shoals? Um, so in the discussions I had with the TC to kind of help prep for this memo, we primarily talked about the state sampling. So I don't know if there was any samples from Northeast Fishery Science Center included in that. Um, the general feeling I got from the TC was that for Georgia's bank, there may be some samples uh, or an adequate number of samples to try and take a stab at um, identifying some of the properties of the GSI 30 protocol. But really for Nantucket Shoals, we there is a lack of sampling that has occurred, and so um, it may be quite difficult to do that from where we are right now. Bob Ballou. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I realize that it, New England Council's Amendment 8 came in after the analysis, but I'm wondering if you can speak to the possible, well, I guess the question would be to what extent might the 12 nautical mile closure uh, overlap existing spawning areas and, and have an impact on protecting spawning uh, populations. Is, it, it's obviously would be conjecture, I would guess, but I'm wondering if you might have an, uh, any thoughts on that, Megan. Thank you. Um, so I'll start and note that obviously this has not been implemented yet, so it's going to still have to go through review by GARFO and we'll see what happens there. Um, you know, obviously there has been historically a fair amount of catch off the backside of the Cape and in that Nantucket Shoals area that I've been referring to. Um, so I think we would have to see where that catch migrates. And a lot of that may be also impacted by these large reductions in the ACL that we're expecting to see. So if and where that catch migrates could uh, impact uh, the effects on spawning. Um, but I do believe portions of that area in green are within the 12 nautical mile buffer, but there has not been a formal analysis that we've done. David Borden. Yeah, I, um, thank you. Uh, did the New England Council, I guess is a question th through the chair to Terry, did the New, New England Council offer up any preferences on these issues? Specific to spawning closures offshore? No. Dr. Pierce? Yeah, regarding the question that was asked about the buffer zone and to what extent might it overlap into areas where sea herring spawn, it pays to hang around for a while. Um, I was around in the 1970s, spent a lot of time on herring back then, working with the New England Council on the early development of the sea herring plan. And there's one paper that I would reference for everyone's uh, uh, look see, and it's one that was uh, that can be found in the NAFO Scientific Council Studies. This is a 1983 changes in time and location of herring spawning relative to bottom temperature in the Georges Bank and Nantucket Shoals area, 1971 through 77. Well, obviously, that's a while ago, but still, back then, uh, it's quite clear from the plots of larvae, herring larvae that were found through the sampling done by uh, foreign nations working on, on research you know, with, uh, with their U.S. counterparts that uh, some rather significant areas uh, of spawning um, do, or do overlap, using these data, do overlap with, uh, with the buffer zone. Not all, of course, but certainly a considerable amount. So it, uh, staff should, uh, I'll make the paper available to staff because you'll find it uh, quite interesting since it, it really does have a lot to say about uh, George's bank as well. <laughs> Richie White, and then we'll go to Terry. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I don't have a question, but I have a motion when uh, it's appropriate. Thank you, Richie. Terry Stockwell. Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. Follow up to uh, a comment made by David Pierce concerning spawning areas in Georgia's Bank and and uh, Nantucket Shoals. In, in the past, uh, uh, when this section or the previous section had c contemplated spawning in the offshore waters, there was opposition. Uh, by the TC towards the development of this act of uh, any related action. Part of it was because um, the uh, um, state of Maine did the heavy lift with the sampling in Area 1A. We, we, there, there was no 
willing partners in southern New England. Part of it was because uh, the samples require uh, fresh fish. The uh, implementation of RSW since then is, has since changed that. But also part of it was they, uh, the TC, at least in my recollection, was not sure exactly what specific areas sh should be closed. And um, so I, I guess um, my question is to Megan, it, did the TC have discussion uh, 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 in starting to drill down into specific areas because, you know, in any, assuming this, this um, a motion is made and it goes forward in this collaboration with the Council for an Action in Federal Waters, the uh, New England Council is going to be heavily invested in, in, in um, trying to ensure that there is still some fishery out there after uh, 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 pushing the trawlers uh, off 12 miles, assuming that is CARFO approves that proposed measure. So there was no uh, specific location that was identified by the TC. I think we were talking more broadly about those areas, but we did talk about, um, as I mentioned in the presentation, kind of one large spawning closure versus multiple smaller spawning closures and kind of the pros and cons of those approaches. Uh, so that's more where the discussion went with the TC. Yeah. Renee is here as our TC chair, so she'll speak to that. So speaking to that, if you look at the table in the white paper of the number of samples that we have for with GSI values for uh, Georges Bank Nantucket Shoals spawning, there's not a great deal of information there. So at this point, the only thing that the TC could recommend is a broad sweeping closure. There, there's not enough information, we believe, at the moment to get down into more discrete spawning areas with different temporal nature to them. Eric Reed followed up with Pat Kelleher. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Uh, just a point of clarification, just so we all know. Um, the action by the New England Council restricts a gear type. It doesn't necessarily restrict effort inside a, a buffer zone. Um, it's midwater trawl specific, and whether or not that effort and those vessels repurpose to persaining or small mesh bottom trawling is certainly allowable. So whether or not uh, we protect spawning fish because of a midwater closure is uncertain because of the the action of the fleet once the thing is enacted, should it be enacted. Thank you, Eric. Pat Kelleher. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I just th thinking about what Terry uh, Stockhold just brought up, that the TC memo. Um, I, I do know both DMR staff and Mass DMF have uh, coordinate pretty closely. They've got pretty impressive spawning protocols in place for uh, for sampling and. Um, I think moving forward, there's probably going to need to be more collaboration if we went down this road, but from talking to my staff, um, I know it's, uh, from their standpoint, it's doable, and uh, uh, hopefully um, Mass DMF would feel the same. I think it's, uh, since now with the refrigerated seawater and how these fish are being uh, handled, I think we've got a uh, much better potential uh, than we have had in the past, uh, at least in relationship to the uh, memo that Terry spoke of. Thank you, Pat. Any other questions? Seeing no other questions, I will go back to Richie with his motion. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, because we don't have anything in the toolbox beyond protecting spawn to try to turn this uh, species around, um, I'll make a motion uh, regards to uh, Area 1A. So I'd move to initiate an addendum to consider strengthening the spawning protections provided to Atlantic herring in the Gulf of Maine. This addendum should consider measures including, but not limited to, the closure period length and GSI 30 trigger value. Is there a second to this motion? Seconded by David, Dr. Pierce. Richie, would you like to speak to your motion? Yeah, I don't think I have too much to add, although, <clears throat> although I think we just have to do everything we can uh, to assure that uh, we get as much spawn as we possibly can. And I think that goes to making sure we do not disrupt spawning prior to the event 
as well as immediately after spawning. <clears throat> Is there anybody that would like to speak to this motion in favor or against? Seeing none, we can vote on this motion. Are there any ob objections to this motion? Seeing none, the motion carries unanimously. Dr. Pierce. Yeah, since we're uh, dealing with the issue of spawning fish and protecting spawning fish, uh, I have a motion I would like to make, and Megan has the motion. And this is a motion that um, is tied to um, an executive committee discussion that's going to occur uh, later on, I think tomorrow or the day after. I've lost track of time already. Uh, where we discuss as an executive committee allocation of approximately $400,000 and plus of funding from Congress and one of the priority projects that has been suggested by the executive committee, not yet adopted yet, but one of the projects relate to, relates to Georgia's Bank Nantucket Shoal spawning and the increased sampling that uh, is needed for us to better divine when and where they are spawning, all again with the objective of increasing spawning protection and dealing with the status of the stock, which is uh, now uh, very poor notwithstanding we're not overfished and overfishing is not occurring. Uh, so I've, uh, I, uh, I, make, um, I move to request the uh, ASMFC Executive Committee direct funds to initiate a research program for increased sampling to support herring spawning protections in the northwest corner of George's Bank in Nantucket Shoals. Protection through a 2020 ASMFC addendum to the ASMFC Sea Herring Management Plan the board recognizes the need for increased sampling in these regions in order to inform management and protection. Recognizing the New England Fishery Management Council as a federal partner in the management of, sea of Atlantic herring, the board requests the council consider herring spawning protection in its 2019 priorities. If I get a second, I'll make mention of one other thing. Is there a second? Senator Waters. Dr. Okay, I, 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 we need to get additional information needed to um, uh, put in place an addendum. I didn't want to just say move to have an addendum right now because we don't have enough information that would justify that. However, we do need to send a signal that uh, through an addendum, we, we need to implement this, an approach for this protection. So if we give 2019 for the acquisition of information regarding where and when, it's not going to be um, everything we ever want, to, ever want to get, but still it's a good step in the right direction. And then through this motion, I make it very clear, or we would make it very clear that in 2020, we would then have that addendum and it would draw upon the information collected through this research program and uh, other information that we made available at that time. Uh, clearly, there's a need for the New England Council to be on board with this. Um, we are, in a sense, continuing to manage federal waters fisheries by virtue of spawning uh, regulations, spawning closure regulations, and that's, that's fine. That's all well and good. So uh, that's, the, that's the reason, the primary reason why uh, the last part of the motion uh, references the council to once again send a signal to them that, that uh, they need to be on board. Of course, I'm a member of the council, so they need to be on board regarding the sea herring protection uh, in federal waters, Nantucket Shoals, and Georgia's Bank. Thank you, Dr. Pierce. Senator Waters. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I had a question really for um, Mr. Pierce on this. So um, as you referenced towards the end of your comments about the ways in which, in a sense, we're monitoring an area in federal waters through spawning protection. So the intent of your motion here is that regardless of any schedule or agreement with the Fisheries Management Council, that we would commence under our own authority this sampling and research to prepare for an addendum? Yes, that's correct. Yeah. Richie White. Thank you, Madam Chair. And um, also that you're uh, suggesting that, that the council um, <clears throat> put this a priority in 2019, is your, would your intent be that if they do not or they're not 
uh, uh, they don't proceed along this line that we then go ahead on our own. Yes, uh, absolutely. Uh, this needs to be done, and we have done it for the Gulf of Maine for quite a long time now. Uh, the, the New England Council years ago said it didn't want to enter that, uh, that arena, and we took it on. I suspect there may be a change of heart now in light of the status of the stock. So again, this sends a signal, and if I recall correctly, the discussions that occurred at the New England Council meeting when we last had that, that there was a shared concern about the status of the stock. So I suspect the motivation is now there to uh, move in this direction. Um, Pat Kelleher and just uh, Renee did just whisper in my ear that for 2019 um, spawning in the Georgia's bank area is a research priority for the council um, that Terry it's it's listed it's on the list of things so um, Pat thank you madam chair um, question for David to the chair I'm just trying to I guess I'm trying to get my head around this still why we would need to initiate a research program to do this. I mean, from a sampling protocols, with with the low quotas that we're going to have, it seems like we've got enough staff between the Commonwealth and the state of Maine to collect and, and process samples. What, 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 what are the, what's the research you're trying to get at? Is it to define, further define the areas? Um, if you could help me out, I'd appreciate it. Yeah, that, I've got uh, the memo from Bob Beal to the executive committee regarding prioritizing the ASMFC plus of funding, and there's a lot of text associated with each idea. And um, regarding the Georgia's Bank and Nantucket Shoals maturity sampling uh, that would be needed for us to initiate spawning closures in those areas, uh, staff did a very good job describing, you know, why we do need more information, more samples to be acquired in order to better define, especially on George's bank, the sequential nature of spawning that may be occurring on the bank. It's very much related to temperature. It's a thorny issue to say the least. So, like, again, this spot, this this information, this data that will be collected in 2019. You know, would go a long way towards setting the stage, giving us the, the necessary justification, analytical work for an addendum to justify, again, that which will eventually be put in place for that protection. Follow up, Pat. Yeah, thank you for that, David. So the, the idea is we'd have the additional research done, we'd initiate an addendum. What that addendum would be sort of a, a, a joint management effort between the Commission and the Council at that point? Uh, not necessarily. Uh, if the Council can't move fast enough and probably won't, uh, we would do it because we have the ability to move quickly. Uh, the Council cannot. So I would suspect that whatever the council decides to do, if anything, um, it would not be until 2021, 22. But we can do it in 2020. We could maybe do it in 2019, but I don't think we're going to have enough in hand to carry the day to get it in place for 2019. So we acquire the information, then we're in a good place, and uh, we'll have the justification for uh, putting this in place. Plus, of course, we're, we're now working with much lower, lower quotas, so um, it, it fits well. So I think you're getting to the, the kind of the little bit of the crux of my problem here is, is a timing issue. And with, with the amount of information that we have at hand, I'm, I'm surprised we can't find a way to have something in place sooner than 2020. Considering the status of the stock, it seems to me that the more we can expedite this process, process, the better off the, the management of the resource would be. If, if I may, just in that document that I referenced, it's noted that the majority of samples have come from George's Bank. Only two samples came from Nantucket Shoals. So there's no way we're going to be able to justify an Nantucket Shoals spawn enclosure with two samples, I suspect. Um, this, is a, this is going to be a very significant action taken by this commission. If indeed we take that action, I suspect we will 
We really need to be in a position to, to defend it to the extent that we can. Two samples is not going to do the job. If I can try to help to add some clarification for information that was in the memo that went to the executive committee. Um, I've had a couple of conversations with Micah, Renee, and Matt Sieri, all um, TC members from the three northern states. And in my understanding, and Renee, correct me if I'm wrong, but that the TC has enough information to make a, as Megan said earlier in her memo, a broad brush uh, for George's bank. Um, and that the sampling that's occurring right now um, informs that and that this would most likely be closures that would work similar to how Eastern Maine occurs because there aren't enough samples um, coming in on a regular basis and what we think will happen if there is an extremely reduced um, quota, there won't be a lot of samples then as well, that that closure would work very similar to Eastern Maine by the default dates that get established through the work that MICA has already done and then would have discussions with the rest of the TC on evaluation of that work. Um, so there would be a way to um, use that information. If we wanted to do something more defined and more specific, then we would need that additional funding in order to have that sampling, which probably wouldn't be sufficient enough, if I'm correct, Renee, from just fishery dependent data, and you would need to pay fishermen to go out and do samples. Um, so if, I don't know if that helps your discussion along at all or not. Um, I will go to Pat, and then I have Terry, Richie, and Eric Reed. Uh, thank you, Tony. So if, if that's the case, it seems to me we could potentially initiate some sort of a process for 2019 and fine-tune it in kind of a parallel track and then fine-tune it with the, with additional data moving forward. If that's the will of the board, then it, it would be prob an option. Terry Stockwell. Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I appreciate the intent of the motion. Um, but I do want to point out to the board that unlike uh, the Area 1A uh, spawning closures, which include state waters, these proposed closures are solely in federal waters, and the council is going to have an active interest in having some participation uh, in, in the discussion. A um, um, little concerned process-wise about the um, request to the council to uh, uh, consider herring spawning protection in 2019 priorities. Um, if, 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 the, if this was to move to the top of the, of the bar, uh, the uh, council and the committee would begin work on this soon in, in the winter. Uh, it would be ready uh, for a council vote at the April or June meeting for implementation of uh, 2020. The lag period that I see in the motion on the board uh, is due to the research program, and I would think that that might put the, the commission and the and the uh, council out of sync. And I think if should this move ahead, it's going to be very important to have both parties working closely together in order to have the outcome we all are hoping uh, additional spawning uh, protection might might result in. Richie, and then Eric. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, <clears throat> I guess I would ask the um, uh, state of Maine and the Commonwealth of Massachusetts um, if they're going to have the financial resources to uh, expand their sampling uh, in, into these new areas. And if not, shouldn't we also be asking for plus up money uh, to implement uh, the spawning closure plan? Dr. Pierce. The motion does, Richie. Uh, begins by making that request to direct those funds. Again, that's one of the priority projects that staff has recommended to the executive committee. So if the executive committee says thumbs down, then we don't have the, the funds necessary to do the sampling. Uh, Bob. Just a, a quick comment on the memo and what's included there. and not. You know, it went to the executive committee, but not everyone has seen that memo. And um, as Dr. Pierce said earlier, the, the commission um, was fortunate enough to get some plus up money this year, about $400,000. And the question to the executive committee is, how do you want to spend that $400,000? 
And one of the five priority projects is this uh, Nantucket Shoals, Georgia's Bank uh, spawning issue. So that it is on the priority list recommended for funding. Um, the, the range of funding that's included in the memo is from $0 to $100,000. So the $0 option is, I think, a little bit as Pat Kelleher may have been referring to earlier, where the existing staff takes samples from existing fishing trips and they just analyze those um, for, for you know, where they stand relative to spawning. But um, if there's additional samples that need to be taken and additional, you know, need to pay fishermen to go out there and collect some samples from specific areas, then that's when you get to the other end of the range. So, um, you know, I think there's there's a range, and, and uh, the executive committee is going to have to decide how much money they want to commit to this. And I, I assume, you know, it is a high priority. Um, but the the difficult part, I think, maybe which is where Richie's going, is that it's not a it's not a one time deal. Uh, it's going to if there's continued monitoring that needs to happen, there's going to be multi year funding that's needed to continue going out, collecting those samples, and analyzing them. And that's a that's a long term funding question. This $400,000 is, is, as of now, just a one-time plus-up. Uh, we're hoping that becomes the new baseline for the Atlantic Coastal Act, and, and we'll have that money moving forward. Um, but we don't know that. And we're, you know, the, the federal budget is still a bit uncertain moving forward. So um, you know, I, I, there is a slug of money that's recommended that, to be used to fund, to cover this work right now. But moving forward, I think that's a, a subsequent discussion that the commission will have to have on where they want to find that money. If we continue to get plus up money, then maybe that discussion is pretty easy. If we don't, then it gets a bit harder. So that's a little bit more background on that memo and the, and the range of funding that's included in that memo. Thank you, Bob. Pat, did you want to respond to Richie's question? Yeah. We, from, from Maine's perspective, we didn't think it was – we thought it looked like it is a wash because we're going to have lower quotas, lower fishing efforts, we figured we would be shifting away from sampling where we would be normally and in, into areas of uh, trying to sample um, th these new areas. So, so just shifting our effort. But w w is, David, is your funding then also going to be impacted by the impacts to RSA? Because don't you have some connection back to RSA for some of that sampling work as well? David. Yes, uh, there is a connection to the RSA, and obviously the RSA is going to go down in terms of the amount available because the quota is going to be dropping. So the amount of sampling that will occur will hopefully you know, be, be augmented by you know, whatever the executive committee feels is appropriate to you know, spend out of the amount available for the, the, that surplus. Eric, thank you for your patience. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'll try to ask a question this time instead of making a statement. Um, yeah, I wanted to bring up the, the discussion about the RSA as well. That is, a, uh, you know, it's one thing to ha have a funding mechanism. It's another thing to have to actually have fish to go get because with the lower tax, you may have a, you may not have any fishing when you're going to want those samples. I mean, that's entirely possible. Um, the RSA program now, as far as I understand it, helps fu fund uh, dockside monitoring. Um, so I, I don't know whether or not, you know, we, we would envision expanding the amount of RSA in order to finance two valuable programs or not. I'm not sure what, what uh, Dr. Pierce has in his long-term vision, but you know, what, what, I guess that's the question. What's the impact that he sees to RSA moving forward once we run out of one year's worth of funding? David, do you have a response to that? Well, regarding this particular initiative on Georgia's Bank and Nantucket Shoals, I mean, I would love to have something long term, but I'm going to be very satisfied with just one year, hopefully, of good information to use, again, as a, as a way to help justify the, the, um, the steps that will be taken through the addendum. I'm looking at one year. I'm not looking long term because looking long term is basically a, a you know wishful thinking. It may materialize. It may not. So um, right now we only have two samples from the Nantucket Shoals area. I don't expect that to be any better than what it is unless we have some additional resources to to get that get that additional sampling. Hence, hence the the motion. Thank you, Adam Nowalski. I think the need for the sampling is clear, and everyone here around the table is in 100% agreement for that. How we wind up achieving that 
through this motion or some variation, I think, is what we're trying to best decide. I see three different elements to this motion. The first part is requesting the executive committee to direct funds. It's my understanding that there's this memo to the executive committee already suggesting that happen. I haven't seen that memo, but it sounds like they're going to get that advice whether or not this board asks them to. And I do have a question about the merits of a species board making that request now, and I wonder what position that leaves other species boards that are going to meet later this week after the executive committee meets in terms of, well, we didn't get our chance to make that similar request. So I'm not sure if there's any staff comment on that, but that's one concern that I have here, that this isn't coming through the policy board or something that has a chance to consider all of these together. The second question I have with this is what comes after the hyphenated portion of that first sentence, protection through a 2020 ASMFC addendum. Does this motion essentially initiate that addendum here today, or is this just a hypothetical that this is potentially how we would use the information we glean here? Thank you, Adam. Um, I'm going to let Bob address the first portion of your question, and then I will go to the maker of the motion to hear what his intent was on whether or not he sees this as initiation of an addendum today, or is it um, being informative of what the long-term thinking would be. Um, and I also would like folks to know that there is coffee outside for those that were asking about it earlier. When you're ready, you can caffeine it up. Bob Beal. Thank you. I'll do this with no caffeine. We'll see how it goes. Um, to Adam's question about you know the, the comment from this board to the executive committee and, and other subsequent boards, the, the list of the five projects that were included in the staff memo uh, was compiled from an email I sent out um, soon after the August meeting to all commissioners saying, what are your high priority fund projects that we would like to see funded? Um, and uh, we compiled all those as well as looked at the a number of research priorities for individual species that are compiled after stock assessments and, and you know a number of things so just you know for full disclosure on the list is one striped bass project two lobster projects a menhaden project and this herring project so you know it's a it's a range of species that are, that are up and down the coast and um, there's adequate money to cover all five of those priority projects um, so you know i don't i don't you know Obviously, if this motion passes, it does convey a message to the executive committee. This board thinks it's important, but I don't think any of the other boards are being shortchanged necessarily because all the commissioners had their opportunity to chime in when, when we developed that list after the August meeting. Thank you, Bob. And I apologize, I said the wrong maker of the motion. Dr. Pierce, what is your intent? Yeah, it's, it's, it's uh, premature to make a motion to have an addendum, so this is uh, informative. Sending the signal. Uh, I've had this discussion with other other uh, board members. Uh, should we initiate it now or not? Um, it's too soon to initiate it. Nevertheless, um, again, it sends the strong signal. Thank you, Dr. Pierce. Senator Waters. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And it seemed to me that if it would allay some of the concerns that were raised about whether this is a directive or not, that we could insert the word potentially after to protection. So um, northwest corner of George's Bank and Nantuck Shoals protection potentially through a 2020. And that might clarify that uh, it's a direction but not, not a requirement. If that's a friendly amendment for Mr. Pierce. I, I prefer to leave it as is with an understanding that um, this board very clearly could say later on in 2019 that it's not prepared to have an addendum. So um, we can change course if need be if the data we have in hand doesn't make a convincing case or if it's strong enough and we still feel um, it's necessary. Richie White. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, 
I'm starting to get concerned now after what Terry said that we're going to hold up the process with this. Um, and what I would rather see the intent of this motion be is that we will start an addendum as soon as we have the information. So it's not let's get the information and then decide what we're going to do. I, I, I want us to go at least as fast as the council can. And if they can, if they can uh, go ahead on the time schedule that Terry just said, we're going to be behind them. And that's not where we want to be. Terry Stockwell. Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. At that point, I, I don't believe the council will move ahead uh, uh, um, based on this motion. It's, it's the way I read it. Research is going to be done. Uh, where the council is being asked to uh, consider herring spawning protection of what nature, where, when, why, how. Um, it's it's a heavy lift, and if we're gonna if the two bodies are gonna work together, it ought to be concurrently, rather than, than asking the the council may initiate something that is totally out of sync with what this board intends to do. Um, we also have a very different process involving the public, <laughs> and uh, the, and and as as someone mentioned, um, it, you know, should the agency approve the uh, the the uh, 12 mile buffer. Um, these boats in, in this fishery has to they have to have some place to fish so um, I'd be concerned about it being approved by the agency if we if we all don't work together you know at Ali sitting on the board right now maybe a little chipping on that but the, every time the council makes a decision we, we try to weigh um, as best we can whether or not it's going to be an approvable action and that's considering er er everything including enforcement, including the TC, including the public opinion uh, before the final decision is made. So um, I, you know, I would support either initiating an addendum right now or, or, um, or perhaps, you know, if, if it's going to ask the council to consider herring spawning protection 2019 priorities, I'm probably not going to vote for this because I don't know what it means. Thank you, Terry. Um, let's take a five-minute coffee break and um, get your caffeine, and we will um, come back to this motion on the table. All right, we're going to take our seats in one minute. I need the rest of the management board to come back to the table out there. I'm failing as your chairwoman. All right, um, we have everyone back at the table, um, and I think we've come to some conclusions in our side discussions here. Mr. Grout. So I'd like to make a substitute motion, if you can put that up on the board. It's a modification of Dr. Pierce's uh, motion, and this is to move to substitute uh, to request that the ASMFC Executive Committee direct funds to in for increased spawning sampling uh, in Georges Bank and Nantucket Shoals. Then the board initiates an addendum to develop a, a herring spawning protection area program for Area 3. And then number th the third point is uh, recognizing uh, any FFCs as a uh, federal partner in the uh, management of Atlantic Herring, the board requests 
the council consider herring um, spawning protection in its 2019 priorities? Uh, Steve Train is the seconder. Any, do you want to speak to your motion, Doug, or your substitute? This is very similar to Dr. Pierce's motion, except essentially we are uh, initiating an addendum right now uh, to try and develop a, a herring spawning program uh, protection area, a pro protection program in area three. And it's important given the uh, for us to start moving down this road because of the status of our stock right now. Uh, we wanted to need to protect as many spawning herring, get something in place to protect as many spawning herring as possible throughout its range. Dr. Pierce. Well, initially I had some reservations about uh, this particular approach. However, we have had those uh, sidebar conversations and um, I'd be convinced that this is a reasonable way to proceed. So it's a substitute to the motion that I had originally made. Uh, you know, I'll be supporting the substitute motion. Thank you, Dr. Pierce. Anybody else? Allie Murphy. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. Um, I think. NIMPS um, fully supports the increased collaboration and efforts that um, have been proposed here, um, but I think I will be abstaining on this uh, motion to substitute and then on the main motion just to allow the process to play out here and, and at the New England Council. Thank you. Any other comments by the board? All right. Uh, are there any comments from the members of the public on this motion to substitute? Seeing none, back to the board, noting that NOAA Fisheries is abstaining. Is there any objection to this motion? Seeing no objection, but one abstention by NOAA Fisheries, this motion carries. So it will become the main motion. I'm gonna give Jess a second to get that all up on the screen. And I will just read this motion. It will no longer have a maker and a seconder. It is a motion of the board. Move to request the ASMFC Executive Committee direct funds for increased spawning sampling in George's Bank and Nantucket Shoals. The board initiates an addendum to develop a herring spawning protection program in Area 3. Recognize the New England Fishery Management Council as a federal partner in the management of Atlantic herring. The board requests the council consider herring spawning protections in its 2019 priorities. Is there any objection to this motion, noting the abstention from NOAA Fisheries? Seeing none, the motion carries. Mr. Grouch. Just a clarification, now that we have the um, National Marine Fishery Service and a council member uh, here, uh, we are recommending that, uh, <coughs> that the council consider spawning herring protection as one of its priorities. Do we need to write a letter now that we have someone from the, the council on the board? Is, a direct, is this something that needs to go to the policy board to approve? Or can, can um, our, the representative from the council just bring that message back to uh, the council? That's the prerogative of this management board. If you would like to write a letter, then we would bring that forward to the policy board to send the letter. Um, if you think that Terry will carry that message strongly <laughs> enough, then we will um, lay that burden on his shoulders. But it's up to the management board. Mr. Kane. Yeah, so moved. We're talking about the vice chair of the New England Fishery Management Council. Thank you. You move to send a letter, or you want to send a letter? Cut myself off. Um, 
So uh, that would mean that the, is there any objection to making a recommendation to the policy board that the commission send a letter to the council requesting that they make spawning protections a priority for 2019? Seeing no objections, we will make that recommendation to the policy board. No, no motion necessary. It'll be on my list for policy board. All right. Any other issues to come before the management board considering spawning protections? Oh, I'm sorry, Bob Ballou. Thank you, Madam Chair. I just want to note the obvious, and that is we've now initiated two addenda, both addressing spawning protections, and I just wonder out loud if there's any um, potential to merge those two or whether they should be kept separate. Thank you. Bob, I think we can, um, staff can look at that and determine if that'll be a possibility. I think it depends on the actions that the New England Council takes. Um, if it is possible for us to do a joint action, then having a, a joint document may not work if the, ti the timing of the two groups um, don't align and if this management board wants to get the changes for the other areas in a more timely fashion. Richie White. Thank you, Madam Chair. Yeah, my intent on the first motion was that it be in place for next year. So it, if the other, if the, this motion can follow the same time frame, which I would be surprised at, then uh, I would, I'd have no objection with the two, but otherwise uh, I'd like to see them done separately. Thank you. Anything else on spawning? Seeing none, we will move on to agenda item number seven, uh, looking at setting the 2019 specifications for area 1A. Megan. That's okay. First, I'm gonna talk about the 2019 to 2021 herring specs. This is just an update on what's been happening, because I know at the August board meeting, there were still some questions. Um, but again, detouring to the New England Council, um, again through Amendment 8, the Council did select a harvest control rule for herring, um, and the one they've selected is 4B revised, which is uh, a light purple dotted line that's second from the top. Um, and just to orient you to the figure, the y-axis is going to be our fishing, and the x-axis is our SSB. And uh, uh, thinking back to the days of Menhaden, it's quite similar in that the further right you are on this graph, uh, the healthier and higher your SSB is, and so you can fish at a higher rate. Um, but as we move from right to left, our SSB is decreasing, and as a result, our fishing uh, rates continue to decrease. But those decreases happen at different rates and at different times, depending on what line you're on. Uh, so the council chose 4B, um, and that caps overall fishing mortality at 80% of FMSY, um, and then it starts to drop off uh, when we have a lower SSB. So if there are any questions about that, I can try and answer those. Uh, but moving on to 2019 to 2021 specs, originally 2019 was expected to be the start of a new three-year specification package, uh, but there have been some challenges with that. Given that the council uh, just uh, approved Amendment 8, um, this means that the NIMS review and consideration of implementing that document would probably not occur until spring of 2019, and then we would start our implementation of a spec package, and so that likely wouldn't occur till summer of 2019. So we'd already be halfway through the year before the spec package is implemented. Um, and this is of concern because the 2019 catch limits are expected to be reduced due to the poor stock status. So if we roll over the 2018 catch levels into the start of 2019, our probability of overfishing and being overfished would be too high. So as a result, the Council has recommended that NOAA Fisheries develop an in-season action to set 2019 catch limits, and this means that our next spec package would start with 2020. In their motion, the Council did provide guidance to NOAA Fisheries on the 2019 in-season action, and that guidance included using the harvest control rule selected in Amendment 8, proportionally reducing the fixed gear set-aside, setting the border transfer to zero, 
and then maintaining the sub-ACL proportions from the last spec package. So we would continue to divide the, the ACL the way we did in the 2016 to 2018 specification package. In terms of timing, we are expecting that a proposed rulemaking will be published ahead of the December New England Fishery Management Council meeting, so we'll have a bit more information then. I also did want to note that there was a SSC, SSC meeting on October 10th to consider Atlantic herring OFLs and ABCs, um, and those that are on the screen are what the SSC approved. I want to highlight asterisks uh, that these are not set in stone yet, so uh, these will be reviewed by the New England Council, and then they'll be forwarded to NOAA for their consideration. So these are not final numbers, uh, but I did want to put these up on the board so that the board has some idea of the level of reductions that we could be looking at in this fishery. Um, and just to put some context to this, um, right now our Area 1A sub-ACL is just under 28,000 metric tons, and so that number is higher than any of the ABCs that you see in this table here. Uh, so that shows the level of reductions that this fishery is looking at. Um, the SSC will also recommended that the New England Council request an operational stock assessment update in 2020, and this was due to uh, concerns about or uncertainty regarding recruitment. And with that, I'll take any questions. Dr. Pierce. And Megan, I can't recall the, the numbers you showed, the SSC uh, determinations, the OFLs, the ABCs. Uh, do those numbers include the application of the control rule that you just mentioned? I believe they do. Any other questions? Pat. I guess it's not a question, it's a comment. Is it time for comments? I don't want to step on anybody's toes, Madam Chairman. I didn't see any other hands raised for questions, so we can move into comments. Um, thank you. So the, so the SSC recommendation for the Council to request an operational stock assessment for 2020. Um, I know the NRCC is meeting in a couple weeks to set priorities for, uh, for assessment work um, coming up. As it pertains to herring, we, we know we have a lot of two-year-olds coming up in this population. The Canadian weir fishery is at roughly 11,000 metric tons um, this year alone. These are fish that are not counted yet. They have not been part of the assessment process. And I'm wondering if it would be worthwhile and if what the, the thoughts of this board would be, if it would be worthwhile having staff attending the NRCC to request a, a, an update in 2019, excuse me, yeah, in 2019 instead of 2020. I, mean, I think there's a lot on the, obviously a, a lot at stake here, um, and having an update with the recent catch data may be very beneficial to the conversation of this board and the council um, over the next few years. Eric Reed. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Um, at the SSC meeting, there was a lot of discussion about 2021, about setting that number. There was a lot of discussion. Uh, that's where the request for an update in 2020 came from, because, because of what is at stake. Uh, I, and. <coughs> The discussion basically said, yeah, you can ask for an operational stock assessment. Good luck getting it. I mean, we all understand the gravity of the situation, and ho hopefully that will be what prevails. But I, I don't want to say that the 2021 number is only a placeholder, but that, that's what I would like to say. Um, but that, that's where the, the request for 2020 came in, so, it, so they could s revisit 2021 and maybe pick a, a more informed number. Um, I, I don't, th that doesn't necessarily 
talk about 2019, Mr. Kelleher, but just, just so we're clear on what the conversation was about 2021 and where that request was coming from. So, I mean, I, I don't know if that helps anything or not, but uh, I, th there was a long conversation about what to do with 2021 in that room, so. Follow up, Pat? No, I, I mean, I appreciate that, and I appreciate the conversation that happened at the S SSC. Um, but we're now seeing more and more data associated with the catch in Canada. Um, it's still not clear to me what this 11,000 metric ton catch with the Canadian weir fisheries means to us in the future from, and I think the agent would be nice to get input from the agency on, does that mean payback? Does that not mean payback in the future? But um, frankly, that's the least of my worries. I'd rather see if we can't get a turn of the crank or whatever we want to call it to, to add this new data and to see if it really changes the future of how we're looking forward at, uh, at management over the, the next three to six years. Dr. Pierce and then Terry Stockwell. That, if I may, uh, Madam Chairman, uh, Pat, you said that the Canadian fishery, fixed gear fishery took 11,000 tons. And what was it the year before? Do you recall? Zero? Uh, I, I asked the question because we've been lucky over the years because the Canadians have caught hardly any in their fixed gear fishery. They're not subject to our rules to restraints on catch. And we take off the top of what's available for U.S. fishermen, what the Canadians are expected to take. So if this is a new number that's larger than we anticipated it would be, it's going to come off the top of U.S. catch, which means these numbers will plummet down to half of what they are now. At least that's my current thinking. This has to be clarified. This is a real, this has been a stumbling block for me over the years, always with the fingers crossed, Canada don't take many fish. If it took 11,000, then we're in trouble. Terry Stockwell, then Doug Grout. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, as a long-term participant in the NRCC, um, I just want to uh, brief the board briefly on the uh, ongoing assessment uh, prioritization pr process as well as try to manage the board's expectations. The um, NRCC is comprised of the New England and the Mid-Atlantic Councils, th uh, this commission, uh, uh, GARFO and the Science Center. It meets twice a year. Its primary purpose is to, st is to schedule the uh, stock assessments with a whole lot of caveats um, and a whole lot of uh, resource issues. Um, each council and the commission all have pressing issues. So um, we're in the process of, of um, contemplating entering into a, pr a programmatic uh, scheduling process, which will set things out into a, a probably a five to seven year time period out. So it seems likely, unlikely, that any accelerated uh, Atlantic Herring uh, update would happen in 2019. Um, and uh, it's, it, as one member of the New England Council said, be careful what you ask for. The New England Council asked for an update on Gulf of Maine Cod and it got worse. So um, um, we do meet, Tony and Bob come, come to these meetings, Pat Canfield as well, and, and we'll, we'll troll it out there, but you know, the, the uh, uh, Mid-Atlantic has its issues and the center has its resource problems and, and both councils and the commission have, have a, a, a very long wish list as well. Doug Grout. So um, one of the things we have to take into consideration here, obviously, is that um, the uh, Canadian herring catch in their weirs, um, that is set by, uh, that is how we've been using, that is what we've been using primarily to set as the management certainty. So we've been reducing our ABC by that amount, what an average historical, recent historical amount has been to set the ACL. So um, um, I can see where, it, to Dr. Pierce's point, 
where when we start putting together our 2020 uh, and 21 specifications where that may impact um, how much management uncertainty we're going to be setting between the, ABC, the already low, very, very low ABCs and the, uh, um, and the uh, uh, ACLs that would be setting there. So that is of concern. I don't know how it, it would work in from that NIF standpoint is how much they might approve on this just because it might if we hit, if we're not um, if we're uh, too cons or not conservative enough with this they may say that we have a chance of overfishing Okay, so there has been a recommendation by a member of the board to ask the NRCC to bump up the herring assessment to 2019, an update for 2019. Is there concurrence by the management board to do so? It's currently on the, the books in the current assessment schedule for 2021. Doug Grout. I certainly would support that. I'd support any either being moved up to 2019 or 2020. 19 would be perfect, would be ideal, but if we could get it to 2020, that would be great too, so that we could be setting the specifications for the next uh, three years with current information. No objection. Um, Bob and I can take that to the NRCC and make that request. Eric Reed. Yeah, so that, that's 2019 is in addition to 2020. Is that correct? Or is it, a, is it a, are we sub, trying to get it substituted? My understanding is to substitute it to get it in 2019, um, to get it earlier. It's currently, we currently have updates on the books for 2021 and 2024. I think if we were to be successful in getting it earlier, then the NRCC would then readjust that schedule to make another update work within that time frame. I wouldn't be able to quote exactly when that would be or not. If we wanted to make a suggestion for a second one for to follow up, would we want another one in 2021? We could also bring that back to the NRCC. It's the pleasure of the board. Doug. I think one of the issues here, and the reason the SSC brought up the recommendation for uh, 2020 was to have specifications, have an assessment uh, approved uh, in time to start developing the next three years worth of specifications. Now in 2021, having an assessment, um, it's, we're going to end up in the same situation we were originally at here where those assessments typically take place uh, later in the year and so we're trying to s develop a specification package sort of um, while not really knowing what the results of the assessment are. So if we had one in 2020, um, we'd, we'd uh, be setting the specifications for 21 and for the next three years with a full knowledge of what that is. Having an assessment in 2021 would be, I, I always see that as a challenge because it's so close to the time that we have to uh, set specifications. So I'm in favor of bringing it up, moving it up. Eric Reed. Yeah. Um, thanks, Mr. Grout. I appreciate that. But I just want to tell you that at that SSC meeting, I mean, this is this is a request from the SSC, which I, which to me that means something, you know. But the conversation about setting 2021 they were just about split down the middle about maybe only doing a two-year spec but it was um, staff from the council that 
um, said that, that they really wanted three years out of it. So, uh, you know, the SSC at, at about 50, 50, 60, 40, something like that, I think would have easily gone with a two-year spec and then gotten the thing in 2020 and then set 2021. Uh, just, just so you know the, the, what went on and, the, and the, the, the thinking in the whole thing. I mean, to me, if this board is going to ask for, uh, to switch it to 2019, that's fine with me. Um, but I would certainly hope that the New England Council through its SSC would ask for one in 2020 just because of where it came from. I mean, I think that's a very important component we should be aware of. I mean, if they ask for it, that means something. So just, just so we know what dynamics we have. Bob Beal. You, you know, if the board does want Tony and I to bring forward the message and request the 2019 update or operational assessment or whatever we're calling them these days, um, you know, I think we need the backing of the council, you know, to kind of pull back the curtain on NRCC. If only ASMFC is asking for the 2019 and New England Council doesn't support that. I don't. We'll never get the 2019 slot, to be pretty blunt. Um, so I think we need to, <clears throat> excuse me, we need to coordinate with the with New England and see what what timing would work best for them as well prior to the NRCC. NRCC is the 14th, 15th of November. Doug Grout. So another way of saying that is that we'll have a much stronger chance of getting an, uh, uh, a change to the updated assessment if we're both uh, recommending the same thing as opposed to separate. So I guess in that sense, I would be more in favor of 2020 so that we have a better chance of actually getting something changed from 2021. Eric Reed. Thank, thank you, Madam Chairman. So, uh, my question is, how, do, how does the timing of all this work? I mean, the council's not going to meet until December. Um, so, how are we going to have this conversation? You're going to have uh, Mr. Stockwell on his first tour of duty at, at the management board to go up to New England and raise hell? I don't know. How's that going to work out? Um, but, I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm all in favor of safety in numbers. Given that it's coming from the SSC, I mean, to me, that I've said it three times. I'll say it four or five times more if you'd like. That's fine. But, you know, what do you envision as your mechanism to uh, talk to each other? Bob Beal. Well, I think, you know, we can go, we can talk staff to staff, and if, you know, there is the standing recommendation, as you mentioned, Eric, for the SSC to, to accelerate this to 2020. And if that's where this board ends up, then I think, you know, it's pretty easy. I think we can, we can get aligned pretty easily. You know, the New England Council staff and leadership that shows up at NRCC will probably bring forward their the SSC recommendation. So we can, you know, if this board says 2020, the SSC says 2020, we can probably, you know, make that request, unified request at the November meeting. Okay, uh, Ray Kane. Yeah, a question. Thank you, Madam Chairman. In the past, we've had a three-year specs package. So, with the conundrum which occurred recently with the stock assessment, the Garfo will come out with specs for 19 by the middle of 19, by June. Can you answer that question, number one, please? Allie, do you have a response of when specs will come out? So I believe. <laughs> you want me to go, Allie? Or? The question is: Is when will the specs package come out on the 2019 fishery from from NOAA Fisheries? Uh, thank you. Uh, I believe the plan is to have a proposed rule, hopefully, on the street ahead of the New England Council meeting so that it can be discussed then. I believe that's early December. 
um, you know, and then probably another several weeks before the final rule is out. Thank you. Is that follow up, Ray? Follow up. So, in the specs package, we're talking 19, 20, and 21, right? No. That'll be just 19, and in a moment, Megan will finish her presentation and will give us some, some more information. But So 2019, it's the recommendation from New England Council is for an in-season action, and so the spec package would be uh, started in 2020. Follow-up. Once again, for three years, 2020, 2021, 2022, or 20 and 21? We, we don't know yet. We'll find out unless Allie knows the difference. Terry, St Terry Stockwell? Yeah, thanks for the question, Ray. The, uh, the agency's doing the interim rule for 2019. The council's going to do a two-year spec package. If Mr. I may. Kane. So if we turn the crank in 20, and that's what I'm hearing around the table as opposed to 19, to work in concert with Garfo, we would be addressing the 22, 3, and 4 specs package? Are we going to get back to a three-year specs package, number one? And if we turn the crank in 20, would that be addressing 22, 3, and 4, or 21, 2, and 3? We don't have the answer to that question right now, Ray. It could be a three-year, or it could just be a two-year, and then you'll get back into the three-year cycle, because you could inform 20 just 21 actually I guess it would be a one year then um, and then go back into your regular cycle or or not but we'll find out as these things come forward and, Thank we get, you. and if we get information at different times Adam so this won't answer Ray's question but I will offer that dealing with summer flounder and black sea bass for the last five years probably We've gone through this process of the council setting a three-year spec process that goes on, the service putting forward a rule. We get new information. We go to the NRCC. We push for an update. The Science Center has usually been as helpful as they can be. We then bring it back. We reconsider the spec package that we'd already sent up. The service has been as accommodating as they can be to change that. This idea of this three-year spec package really has been nothing other than an attempt to make the paperwork more efficient for council staff, but in reality, we've been going back and doing it pretty much whenever we want to, whenever we could, and I'll just offer that we found the Science Center to be, and Garfo to be very accommodating to the best of their ability. Thank you, Adam. All right, we're going to move on to the rest of Megan's presentation. All right, so now we're going to talk about 2019 Area 1A specifications. Shut myself off. Uh -huh. So if this was a typical year, what we would do is I would be looking for two motions at this meeting. I would we would do a motion to approve the spec package, and then there would be a motion to allocate the 2019 Area 1A sub-ACL with the percentages that you guys would want to see. So these are example motions. Um, unfortunately, we all know that this is not a typical year. Um, so we do not know what the 2019 numbers will be. We're still waiting on some more information. So we're going to postpone that to a future meeting when we have uh, the 2019 specs from NOAA. However, this board can talk about the 2019 Area 1A sub-ACL, given we have pretty uh, strong suggestion that the ACL will be significantly lower next year than it is right now. So per Amendment 3, the board can consider distribu distributing the Area 1A sub-ACL using bimonthly, trimester, or seasonal quota periods. The board can also decide whether quota from January 1 through May 31 will be allocated to later in the fishing season. And recently, this board has allocated the Area 1A sub-ACL such that there's 0% allocated from January through May, 
72.8% from June through September, and then 27.2% from October through December. So these are tables five and six from Amendment 3, and we'll leave them up on the slide here. They were also included in your supplemental materials. And so these are the options that are built into Amendment 3 for the board to consider regarding the Area 1A quota periods. I do want to highlight that these allocation percentages are fixed, so they can only be changed through an addendum process. And with that, we'll take any questions. Seeing no questions, are there any comments? Doug Grout. I'd like to put forward a motion, Madam Chair. Go ahead. You can put that up. I gave that to you. It's to move to allocate Area 1A quota bimonthly in a manner consistent with the options in Table 5 in Section 4.2.3.2 of Amendment 3 that is labeled no landings prior to June 1 and in parens with June as a one month period. And this results in the following distribution. Period 1, which is June, 16.4%. Period 2, which is July, August, 40.1%. Uh, period 3, which is September, October, 34.0%. And period 4, which is November, December, 9.5%. The fishery will close when 92% of the seasonal periods quota has been harvested, uh, and any underages from one period may roll over, be rolled into the following period. And if I get a second to this, I'll provide some rationale. Is there a second? You can't do it. Pat Kelleher, thank you. Doug. Thank you. Um, I think with our lower quotas here um, uh, that we are anticipating here for 2019, it would be very imprudent to con uh, increase the flexibility for management and monitoring of our quotas, and that's why I'm proposing to go one of the reasons I'm proposing to go to a bi-monthly as opposed to a trimester approach, which is what we've been using before, previously. Um, allocating quota bi-monthly while maintaining the days out program will allow for a targeted harvest of Atlantic herring during the months of July through September when the supply of fresh herring for bait is most needed and help further minimize herring fishing activity around the fall spawning season in herring management area 1A. Dr. Pierce. Yeah, first a question. Uh, I don't have Amendment 3 in front of me. We made decisions about what to do with uh, periods a while ago. The Amendment 3 provides us with the ability to, on an annual basis, without going out to public hearing, make changes in the percentages, correct? All right, interesting. That, that is correct. This is okay. one of the options that you have okay. every year. Okay, uh, a couple of points. Um, obviously, I've sp spoken about this with uh, my colleagues in the other states uh, quite a bit, and I've raised concerns about this uh, bi-monthly approach for uh, this reason. And that is, number one, the New England Council, at its last meeting, we debated, we actually voted on an effort to change the percent allocations of Area 1A quota between the tri-semesters. October through December is the third tri-semester, and that motion was defeated. The Council decided to keep those percentages by tri-semester. With this particular approach, and I recognize the motivation for it, but with this particular approach, setting aside for, for a moment the fact that the quotas are going to be much lower, it's very likely that in September, period three, the 34 percent will be taken, meaning there'll be no landings in October. Okay, which would mean then that the third trisemester would only have 9.5 percent, November and December. 
which is not the way it should be. According to the New England Council that again voted against changing the tri trimester percentages. Uh, in 2018, you know, this year, we had, for example, a spawn enclosure that did not include the first few weeks of October. Uh, October was open in Area 1A for continued fishing. And indeed, some fishing occurred. How much, I'm not sure. But anyways, it's been open for about three weeks. So those uh, water trawlers, notably, waiting to have some access into Area 1A, finally did have that access because the spawning closure had not yet kicked in. It's about to kick in September, uh, October 23rd, something like that. The announcement went out. So with this particular approach, there would be no fishing, in this particular case, midwater trawling, in October, assuming the spawning closure doesn't kick in. Again, we have no way to know for sure. Now, setting aside for a moment the question about whether midwater trawling is a good thing or a bad thing, this particular strategy has the potential to dramatically impact uh, one of the main components of the sea herring fishery, that is the midwater trawlers that are already impacted by the buffer zone, assuming the service puts it in place. So I just wanted to highlight for the benefit of everyone that I recognize the rationale for it, but there is an unintended consequence, and it does put us at odds with what the New England Council uh, just did. Mr. Grout. Um, I'm a little bit confused by uh, Dr. Pierce by your statement that the council um, took a vote on tri semesters. The council doesn't have any uh, seasonal allocation of the quota, it's only an, alloc uh, um, a a an annual allocation. And what they, what we did take a, a vote on was a recommendation on the 2019 specs um, as to how we would allocate between the different management areas. And my uh, Commissioner Kelleher and her staff actually put up a, a, a motion that was defeated that would have, instead of having the current allocation, um, would have, or the current allocation under the specifications process that we had set up uh, back at the beginning of the specifications that we would be using the 2018 allocations. But we, the council doesn't have any seasonal allocations that I'm aware of and, and maybe um, uh, Terry Stockwell can val uh, uh, tell me whether I'm wrong or right on this. <laughs> and actually, Ali, you might be able to tell me, is there any seasonal? allocation in the uh, uh, council plan? Uh. Uh, Dr. Pierce, because Megan and I just were looking at all of the motions that no, just I, I happened. Mean, I'm incorrect. Okay. Right, I'm incorrect. However, uh, my other comment regarding the, the impact on the midwater trawlers, that is the October fishing, you know, still, still stands. Pat Keller. Thank you, Madam Chair. I, uh, I'm, I'm glad you made that clarification. So the, I, I did get hung up a little bit, Dr. Pierce, on where you were going that way. But I, I, I understand the desire to try to maintain some level of access for 1A. But I would also r remind the board that 70% of the quota was allocated to Area 2 and Area 3. So while we're trying to maintain, while you want to try to maintain access for a portion of, of that time of year, I understand, but I, we're trying to figure out a way to also create some level of um, su support for all the, all of the fleet. I mean, we, you're trying to protect a portion of your fleet. I'm trying to protect a portion of my fleet, and we're trying to figure out how to make lemonade out of all the lemons. And so, I, I, I'm as a seconder. I'm going to support this motion. Richie White. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, 
I'm going to support this as well. Um, <coughs> my concern with uh, our uh, current regulations um, that it keeps the 27 percent uh, until after October. And I believe last year very little was caught, if anything, and I think we left a lot of uh, fish on the table last year uh, for the October through December season. And this year, I don't believe there's been one midwater trawl fish caught uh, in Area 1A yet. Um, and if that is the case, we're going to leave like 5,000 tons on the table. And next year, with such a small quota, we can't afford to leave uh, a large percentage like that. <clears throat> the other, uh, the other um, issue is that the Maine, um, in, in the state of Maine, which would be the largest user of herring for lobster bait, um, they have consistently said that they want July in, through September is where the majority of the bait should be coming in for them. Um, for New Hampshire, Massachusetts South, <clears throat> that, that uh, there is some demand later on, uh, the Area 3 fishing uh, can certainly provide that, as we're seeing now, because we are getting landings right now from Area 3. So for, the, for all those reasons, uh, I support this, and I think we need to uh, try to adjust uh, to these extremely low quotas that we're going to be dealing with. Thanks. Any other comments on this motion? Eric Reed. Yeah, uh, thank you, Madam Chairman. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm fine with understanding what Area 1A needs, and, and I'll, I'll support this motion. Um, just a technical question. I, I'm as assuming that any overages would accumulate into the period four if they're not. It just says would be road from one period to the next. I'm assuming that all, all of the underages, if there are any, would accumulate into period four. Is that correct? Well, it would continually roll. So if there was an underage from period one, it would roll into period two. Okay. If that, there that, are two that, to three, I, three to four. That's the way I understand it. I just want to make sure that if if air, if if period two is short and and then I don't want the fish uncaught. I guess that's what I'm trying to say. So okay, fine. Thank you. Okay. Any additional comments? David Pierce, and then Ray Kane, and then we're going to... Yeah, I'll, uh, I guess I still struggle with comments that have been made uh, in public forums, such as at the New England Council meeting when the buffer zone was decided, and the midwater trawlers um, represented by Cape Seafoods out of Gloucester made it clear that the buffer zone would dramatically impact their ability to survive. To what extent that is true, I have no clue, but that's what he said. And the inference was that they're not going to be able to continue to fish with just access to Area 3 because of a lack of fish. Now, whether that's true, I don't know. So my, my point is, if indeed they're not going to be able to, for whatever reason, get fish in Area 3, it means that by losing October with this particular approach, there will be a dearth of lobster bait for lobstermen in Massachusetts I've checked with MLA in Massachusetts, and I've been told that they are very dependent on midwater trawler landings of sea herring in October, of course, prior to any spawning closure. Um, and that would be bait needs by lobstermen from, you know, just north of Gloucester down to Boston. So I try to be sensitive in Massachusetts, as of course the state of Maine is, sensitive to the bait needs of lobstermen. So that's the reason why I, I continue to express concern about this particular uh, approach. If they can find fish in Area 3, then fine. In October, then that'll provide bait needs. But it's, as far as I'm concerned, at this point in time, I don't know whether they'll be able to do that, especially if you have a spawning closure in place. Uh, so um, I'm going to, again, just to, uh, not, not support this, uh, this motion. Ray Kane. Yeah, technical question. So, Doug, going with a period one, two, three, and four, we could drop the uh, conference calls. Right now, we're on that. Potentially, yeah. Potentially, yeah. Right. I don't 
believe so. I mean, the intent would be, uh, I'll tell you what I was um, uh, to try and get as much of the uh, uh, quota into July, August, and September, as I stated. One of the things that I think we'd still have to have is the days out meetings. Um, to one, um, I was hoping that we might set zero landing days in June and then roll over June into um, uh, July and, and, and August um, there. And then I think we'd, we'd have to have a discussion as to whether we're going to have um, uh, landing days um, um, for July and August and September. I, it's going to be caught pretty quick if we don't. And if that depends on what the lobster and the herring fishery, if they want to catch it quick, then we just give them seven days once uh, we get into the July, August, September. And if we want to stretch it out, then we'd have to put in some, some uh, management restrictions. So we'd still have to have some. I think it'd be prudent for us to have a days out call uh, or meeting. Thank you. I can support this motion. I mean, I'm looking at landings right now, and they're catching fish in Area 3, and this is the month of October. They've been catching fish in Area 3 since the end of September. So, I mean, my colleague tells me that fish aren't available in Area 3, but I look at landing reports weekly, and they're catching fish in Area 3 as we speak, and I know uh, there was motion put forward at the New England Council where they wanted to change percentages throughout the sub-management areas, and that was voted down. So you're looking at, what, 27 percent of the overall quota going to Area 1A, so I can support this motion. Thank you, Mr. Kane. In the interest of time, I think uh, unless there's anything else, I'm going to go to the public to see if anybody wants to speak on the motion. Jeff Kalin. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Jeff Kalin with Lunds Fisheries in Cape May, New Jersey. I'm also the chairman of the um, Commission's Herring uh, AP. Unfortunately, uh, this issue wasn't addressed by the Herring AP. Um, didn't know this was coming. I, I kind of suspected it. I, I don't really do think that it is a motion with unintended consequences. I think the co consequences are pretty clear uh, to uh, the Midwater Trawl Fleet here with the potential for the Area 1A um, access to be limited. Um, you know, it's, it's a competition with the Saners, but um, as Dr. Pierce pointed out, uh, the way this works, it's very likely that the opportunity for midwater fishing in the region is going to drop from about 27 percent of that uh, 1A quota to probably 10 percent. Um, no public notice um, and so forth. So uh, really, I am opposed to this. Um, it's important, I think, to keep in mind that Midwater trawl access to the Gulf of Maine uh, not only benefits the herring fishery, but it's an important uh, issue for the mackerel fishery um, managed by the Mid-Atlantic Fishery Management Council. Uh, that's very valuable fish, um, the, the mackerel is. Uh, there's been mackerel in the Gulf of Maine. I think we'll find it again this fall. Uh, I think it's still there. Um, the value of the RSA uh, has been maintained in this region by the New England Council. They have allowed RSA fishing in 1A um, in, in the uh, fall trimester because they recognize the potential to take mackerel and uh, create value in the RSA, which, as uh, was pointed out earlier, is funding the only shoreside monitoring program that's in place right now. So. I think this is uh, unfortunate. I'm opposed to the motion, and uh, I think Dr. Pierce's uh, comments are right on target, and I think this ought to be rejected. Thank you. And maintain the status quo trimester approach that has worked for a long time, and not take, uh, give one fleet another hit here. Uh, we 
we've already reeling from the 12 mile uh, year round buffer that's been proposed, which eliminates the access uh, to the fleet to somewhere around 30% uh, of where we have bought it, found it historically. So here's another hit, and I don't think it's um, warranted. And um, I think you should oppose it in the interest of competition. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kalin. Back to the board. This is a final action. I'm going to see if we have any objections. If we have objections, then I'll have Megan do a roll call vote. Okay. We will do a roll call. Megan? Maine? Yes. New Hampshire? Yes. Massachusetts? No. Rhode Island? Yes. Connecticut? Yes. New York? Yes. New Jersey? No. Uh, New England Council? Abstain. And NOAA Fisheries? Abstain. That's five in favor, two against, zero null, and two abstentions. The motion carries. Yep. Are there any other issues regarding the specifications? Richie White. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, because of the extremely low quota and uh, because um, the board is, uh, lacks some ability of flexibility um, as we've just process we've just gone through. Uh, I propose that um, <clears throat> I'd like to move for a, a initiate an addendum, and this addendum would be attached to the uh, previous addendum approved uh, on concerning 1A. So this is move to initiate initiate an addendum which considers providing the Atlantic Herring Board flexibility to set annual quota period specifications for the Area 1A fishery. So, <clears throat> let's wait and see if I have a second. Do we have a seconder? Steve Train. Richie, to your motion. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, as I said, uh, I, I think with these extremely low quotas we're going to be dealing with for the next probably at least three years that I think having uh, maximum flexibility to figure out uh, when and how uh, we can maximize uh, the herring harvest and use uh, in 1A I think is going to be critical and therefore I think just putting more tools in our toolbox uh, can do nothing but help us. Thank you. Richie, just a clarification question. Does this, do you mean to be able to change the, the, change the fixed percentages? Is that what you're asking for? Yes, it's to expand on the, uh, what there are four, four alternatives in, in Amendment 3 now. So to, to expand those uh, so there's more flexibility. So the uh, PDT would come up with additional options uh, to provide us more flexibility, P possibly monthly quotas. Uh, you know, I'd be looking for whatever options uh, they could come up with. I think it would be helpful if this management board gave them goals and objectives that you're trying to seek. Um, this is a pretty broad range. They might need some definition in order to come back with to you with something specific. So it might be helpful to have a little bit more direction for them. Yeah. Take a couple minute recess. So try to come up with some. What if we um, postpone this 
is it table this table this decision and let Pat go over his enforcement question under other or we can actually take up uh, the advisory panel and the enforcement while you think about this and then come back to this absolutely all right so motion to table to the end of this meeting is there objection to that seeing no objection we will move on to the advisory panel nomination tina berger thank you madam chair i have one advisor joseph jurek a commercial otter trawl fisherman from massachusetts for the board's consideration and approval to the atlantic herring ap their motion to approve dr. Pierce is there a seconder Bob Ballou. and I will read the motion it's move to approve Joseph Jerk from the state of Massachusetts or the Commonwealth of Massachusetts to the Atlantic Caring Advisory Panel motion by dr. Pierce seconded by mr. Ballou is there any objection to this motion Seeing no objection, the motion carries. Moving on to the next agenda item, Pat, you had an issue on enforcement. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'll, I'll be brief. Um, not that I want to manage on uh, social media reports as it pertains to bycatch, but um, we have seen um, quite a flurry of activity in regards to uh, bycatch of striped bass um, uh, with the herring fishery this year. Uh, the Maine Marine Patrol is in the process right now um, of finalizing an investigation uh, of striped bass bycatch. Um, we believe uh, a summons will be issued for it. Uh, for possession and sale of, uh, of striped bass as it pertains to um, lobster bait. Uh, the, the one um, uh, bit of information that we have right now is um, for, the, for the sample checked out of one load of fish, 5% of the, of, uh, I can't remember how many exactors, but 5% of a uh, tractor trailer load um, uh, was striped bass was not an insignificant amount of fish so um, I just raise that as an issue it's an ongoing issue associated with this and um, uh, would ask that the states talk to their uh, their enforcement folks to see if they are also seeing striped bass within uh, within the herring catch so mr. Kane thank you madam chairman Pat any idea where that fish reoccurred where they caught all these striped bass um, off the Cape Thank you. All right. Any other questions? All right. We're back to you, Richie. How are we doing? <laughs> no pressure. <laughs> and I'm, I'm partway there. Um, so um, I'm thinking that uh, it would contain an option that would eliminate trimester quotas and um, institute quotas to maximize uh, market demands. I don't, I don't know if that's enough or not for the PDT. I'm looking to two PDT members on either side of me. I'm going to confer with them and get back to you yeah madam chair I have a, a little addition yes uh, I would say um, to maximize catch um, in, accordance in, in accordance with market demands Bob Beale. We got a procedural corner we've painted ourselves into. 
So we've got we've got a tabled motion, and we're we're perfecting a tabled motion. So it, you may really want to do a substitute motion, or you can, if if the board's okay with it, you can do friendly amendments to the tabled motion, motion which is a little Robert would be rolling over in his grave, the Robert's Rules of Order, but, um, but the, yeah, the, the board can decide to withdraw that motion if, if you want, and then you can start all over. Any one of those, any one of those options would be good, but we've got to do something on the record. Is it okay for the, if it's, um, I was asking Richie before to just give the PDT a little bit of direction sure. when he, asking for sort of what's the direction to the PDT for what he me meant by flexibility. Um, and so we were not necessarily incorporating it into the motion, but information to take back to the PDT in order to write the addendum. Um, we can um, add it to a motion. It's up to the board. If they feel that, you know, the, the Additional points that Richie made are direction to the PDT and don't need to be included in the motion, and that's that's fine. But it sounded like Richie was was massaging the motion a little bit, was getting a little bit tricky. Richie, yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. Pat uh, has some uh, additional uh, wordage that uh, is going to be much clearer. Okay. We will hear from Pat and then I will ask the board if this is just direction or if we need a motion to substitute. So uh, trying, to, trying to capture what Richie's doing. Um, so this would task the, TC, task the TC to expand quota period options to increase flexibility when distributing area 1A herring quota during years in which the sub-ACLs are lower, may be prudent to concentrate harvest during the months of July through September. However, in years of higher sub-ACLs, choose options that would allow for an expansion of harvest to meet the needs of the market. And just to clarify, that would probably be the PDT, not the TC. What, you, yes. Dr. Pierce. Is this a motion? Uh, it wasn't made as a motion, but uh, it's I'd like to respond to it if indeed uh, it is a motion, and Mr. Madam Chairman, if it's appropriate. That uh, what this is what I feared, and Richie kind of set the table regarding uh, the the motion that we're not addressing now, and that is I could see um, flexibility. All right, considering the state of Maine's demand for bait. Period two, give it all to July and August, 100%. And so therefore, it's only the Perth St. Fishery out of the state of Maine, predominantly. Now, September was put in the remarks made by Pat. Once again, it's all to the state of Maine and the Perth St. Fishery in Area 1A, uh, to, the, to the detriment of any other user, except, of course, for auto trawlers who go out on daily trips. I'm very concerned about actions that this board might take that would be burdensome, overly so, on one important component of the sea herring fishery. And I say that in the context of the highly charged environment in which we are now working regarding the buffer zone. Uh, I, it may not be relevant, but I suspect it may be. I don't want to jeopardize the buffer zone by actions that this board would take that would unduly impact uh, one important element of the fishery, which is the midwater trawlers. And again, I understand why midwater trawling is, is under the microscope, uh, it's under my microscope as well, but this is just too much of, a, of an attempt to um, garner the majority of the um, Area 1A quota for one user group and one state. Pat, I think that we would, based on David's comments, make that a motion to amend the current motion to include what you stated, and we're going to work on that to get on the board. That, that's, that's fine. We're trying to work on kind of the goals, but if we wanted to turn it into a motion to further debate, that's fine. While we're getting that up, are there any other comments? David Borden. 
process. Uh, I'm confused late in the day. Uh, are we making a motion to um, amend a motion that just got tabled? Is that what we're doing? Well, we tabled the motion to the end of the meeting, and then we came to the end of the meeting, so we went back to Richie to ask him for clarification on what he meant by... Um, so that, uh, but the table motion is now on the floor. It's then. now on the floor because okay. it was the end of the meeting. Thank you. And so we have this amendment that provides more specificity on what the goal of the uh, addendum would be, and that is move to amend to include, to task the PDT to expand the quota period options to increase flexibility when distributing the Area 1A herring quota. During years in which the sub-ACLs are lower, it may be prudent to concentrate harvest during months of July through September. However, in years of higher sub-ACLs, choose options that would allow for the expansion of harvest to meet the needs of the market. Motion by Mr. Kelleher, we would need a seconder to this motion. Motion seconded by Mr. White. Richie. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, to respond to, uh, to David's uh, comments, uh, th this would be a, a tool in the toolbox, and it would ha this board would have to approve uh, implementing this. So at the time that this might be proposed, then there could be arguments pro and, ag and against if, uh, if there were both. Um, and those people would have to convince the rest of the board members that it was either a good thing to do or not a good thing to do. Ray Kane. Yeah, can we see some numbers in this motion? I mean, we're talking about lower, higher sub ACL. So, what's the higher sub ACL? what they currently caught for this year, 49,000 metric ton, or is it 90,000 metric ton? So can we put some numbers into this motion? Ray, I think that could be something for the discretion of the PDT to make recommendations to the board if um, the PDT uh, finds that's a prudent way to define the tool and the toolbox that they bring back to the management board, but I'm not sure we would be able to define numbers here today. Um, again, this would be an option in the addendum to be considered. All right, any other comments? Emerson. Thank you. Um, I'm just wondering what market we're talking about here. Choose options that would allow for an expansion of harvest to meet the needs of the market. What, what does that really mean? I just heard Jeff Kalin a few minutes ago saying that his market was going to be negatively affected by our previous motion. Pat Kelleher? Yeah, the bait market. Adam Nowalski. It's my intention, Madam Chair, to allow this motion to amend to be voted on. But prior to voting on the final motion, I intend to make a motion to postpone until we can convene the AP to discuss options to increase flexibility based on public comment, if you'd be so kind as to allow me that at that point. Thank you, Adam. Will do. And I'm going to ask the board to vote on this issue, and then if it passes, then I will take the, the main motion to the, to the public. Any other comments? All right. Then we will vote on this issue. All those in favor, raise your right hand. We're caucusing.
All right, are we ready? All those in favor, please raise your hand. One, two, three, four. Four yeses. Those against? Three opposed. Any null votes? Any abstentions? Two abstentions. Motion carries. All right, so the new motion. We will get that up there in a second. Reggie, you know what your new amended motion says, so if you want to speak, please go ahead. Yes, I just wanted to, uh, uh, Adam's suggestion, um, if this passes and, and it starts the addendum process, the, the advisory panel would, would be commenting on an addendum. So, and so anyway, I, just, I, I don't think they are left out of this process. Adam. It was clear that the fact that we had to table this to this point, that there was some question about the direction we were giving the PDT to look at. Given the comments we've heard already from the public about the process we've gone through today, I think it would be prudent to allow the AP some input to help the PDT craft those options. And that's what my intent will be when the time is ready. All right. I'm going to read the new motion. Move to initiate an addendum which considers providing the Atlantic Herring Board greater flexibility to set annual quota period specifications for the Area 1A fishery. This issue can be included in the addendum initiated regarding the Gulf of Maine herring spawning protections, or it can be a separate document. Uh, we task the PDT to expand the quota period options to increase flexibility when distributing the Area 1A herring quota. During the years in which sub-ACLs are lower, it may be prudent to concentrate harvest during the months of July through September. However, in years of higher sub-ACLs, choose options that would allow for an expansion of the harvest to meet the needs of the market. I'm going to go to the public. Um, in the interest of time, if you, if you do need to make comments, please keep them to one minute. Is there anyone from the public that wants to comment on this motion? Jeff Kalin. Madam Chair, yeah, I'm opposed to this. Um, I think I can see where this is going. There's no mention of equal access for federal permitted uh, fishermen uh, with different gears or anything like that. It's a, another anti-midwater trawl approach. Uh, so we're completely opposed to it. Thank you. I appreciate the members who voted against the motion uh, earlier. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff, and thank you for your brevity. Um, Adam, I will come to you as I said I would before. Thank you. So I would move to postpone this motion until the AP can be convened to discuss options for greater flexibility for setting Area 1A period specifications. Is there a second? Emerson Hasbrook. Adam, do you want to speak to your motion? I think I've added most of it here. Again, I think we've had difficulty directing the PDT. We've heard concerns from the audience. I think it would be good to get some more information to them before we develop this. Thank you. Are there any other comments on the motion to postpone?
Seeing none, we'll vote on this motion. All in favor, please raise your hand. Seven in favor, those opposed? Two opposed, any null votes? Any abstentions? Motion carries. All right, is there any other business that comes before the management board? Seeing none, is there a motion to adjourn? Thank you, Tom Fody. We will start the Eel Board in 10 minutes.